Welcome home. We are WNST AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We hope you're setting a dial and uh, lots of new folks out on YouTube and Nouveau Oriole fans and youngins coming in here to yell at the old fart who uh, feels like he's seen it all now that he's seen ownership change here in Baltimore. Uh, we're going to be taking the Maryland Crab Cake Tour back out on the road. Uh, my guest that's about to come on the program will be a great, great person to join me at Fadley's on the 12th uh, or uh, at Costas on the 9th. We're going to be over Costas on Tuesday talking about um, the bridge tragedy uh, on the peninsula and the place where I'm from. Um, and that's going to be on Tuesday morning. And we're going to do that right up until the game starts. Orioles play the Red Sox at 2 o'clock on the 9th. Come on over to Costas. I'll have some 10 times the cash. I think by the time we get the Fadley's on Fridays, I will have the Pac-Man giveaways from the Maryland Lottery. We'll be there live from 2 until 5. Actually doing live radio because I'm out of my mind and I don't like to pee in the afternoons uh, during live radio. As I get older, it gets a little more difficult. Uh, we are celebrating 25 years of WNST. We are celebrating... 40 years of my media career, and I met this guy 39 and a half years ago at least. Um, one of the stories that I wrote for the Baltimore News American, so we're going way back, is when I met this guy at a Flyers-Caps game after the loss of Pelly Lindbergh. We're going back 40 years now, and um, I'm doing a documentary uh, along with Greg Landry at Blue Rock Productions. This guy is a part of it because he was a long part of our WNSD heritage and covering Ice hockey on Frozen Pond with the Washington Capitals, who one time said they were Baltimore's franchise and then won a Stanley Cup and ignored us. Uh, the owner's trying to move the team even further into Virginia, and that's not gone well. Ed Frankovic uh, was not in Las Vegas the night that the, uh, the the Stanley Cup was hoisted. My wife sat in for him. He regrets it, but uh, still had a long, illustrious career as a journalist. Uh, in the days of uh, Micah Bookdahl and Lou Corletto and Blue Ice at the Capitol Center parking in the Eagle lot, or uh, was it the Freedom lot? I'm not sure. Ed Frankovic joins us now from Parts Unknown in Howard County. He has a real life and a real job that we don't talk about and a family that we love to talk hockey with. And, um, dude, I, I'm reaching to every lost soul I have, people like you, that we probably – had Bill DeWitt owned the baseball team the last 30 years, you probably would have been the uh, alternate baseball reporter through time. I met you through the media space. Your father was a reporter. Um, you were a reporter. And um, boy, how times have changed and the Orioles are sold. And I thought, I'm going to check in with Ed and see how many hockey games he's watching lately. Yeah, watching a lot of hockey and uh, caught a little Orioles magic on Monday night. So uh it, when I got the text from WNST.net and got to be on that text service because you get the news first, everybody. Um, when you sent the text that the ownership had changed, I was like, wow, finally. I mean, it's been, what, 19 or 18 years? Yeah, my daughter was two months old. She's going to be 18 in July when we did the Free the Birds at the stadium. We marched out at 508. I still have my T-shirt. Um, and I was, to be honest with you, Ness, coming into the season, I was like, I, I didn't, I wasn't excited about it because I'm like, you know, they may be good. They got a really good young team, but he's just going to sell it off. He's not going to invest in the team. He's not going to do what needs to do to, to build a winner. Like we used to have when I was growing up in the days of Merv Retman and Don Buford and Paul Blair and all these great Orioles from way back. And, um, but you know, when the text came in and it was official and then you, you know, you said that Cal Ripken was part of the group. Suddenly I was back. I was back interested in Baltimore baseball big time. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to gauge it for everyone because, man, I don't know anybody that loves sports more than you and me. And when I go back and I do this 40th sort of anniversary of being in media and in Baltimore and I go back to – wearing my orange jersey and running down the street in my underwear because we got a football team. And now I see the creep that runs the PR for the Ravens who stands up in front of the reporters and tries to intimidate them. And I had the owner of the football team literally run from me with the general manager. They literally ran from me on a veranda at the Ritz Carlton at 1130 last Monday night, while people like Jim Harbaugh were stopping and hugging me and Joe Ortiz were stopping and Mike Tomlin and John Fox, it's it's just unbelievable how full circle all of this has come. I have yet to meet David Rubenstein. I did meet Michael Arrighetti, 
uh, on opening day. I have reached to a representative. People could be asking, am I getting my media credentials back? And I'm like, if these people are legitimate people, I'll be welcome with open arms as a media member. If they have something to hide and they want to operate the way the other people operated, if that's the way they choose to operate. I mean, the other guy bought the team for $170 million, which is a fake number, and sold it for $1.7 billion, which is not a fake number. Um, and they're getting $600 million from our government. That's not a fake number. Um, and you're paying for that in Howard County. I'm paying for that in Baltimore County. Everybody everywhere is paying for these stadia and these teams. Um, we've really changed the level of obligation from a media standpoint on what we expect from the people who just are so filthy wealthy that they drink off of this and run from reporters that they know full well are there to ask legitimate questions because they can. It's disappointing. Journalism is not what it was when you and I got started in it. It's it's a dirty business. It's a money business now. Um, you're basically paid to support the team. We've known this for years. With you know, we saw it with the Orioles, and unfortunately, with Art Modell, we thought you know, it, and it was it was legit, and it started that way with Steve, and it's just gone downhill. I saw it with the Capitals. Um, Ted Leonsis tried to build his his brand, and he did a good job of it. And he won a Stanley Cup, and then his media became a little bit of uh, uh, over the top, controlling what you wanted to say. Um, and, and that was it for me, right? If I can't say what I want to say, um, I'm a full believer in the First Amendment. If you can't have freedom of speech, what's the point, right? I'm not going to waste my time promoting your private. Well, you don't go to the games anymore, and you know hockey, you specifically. And I don't want to get the get off my lawn, but there's a level of of you know to to whom met much is given, much is expected. And um, I don't know that we we've lowered the bar dramatically. And Rubenstein's coming in at a point where for this franchise, having people like you and me back giving them money and being in the club and being a part of it and telling everyone else to get in the club and recruiting people to go back to the games. Um, you know, I told Mr. Rubenstein's representative this on the club level on opening day. I said, look around, it's full. It'll be empty here on Saturday. It'll be empty on Sunday. It'll be empty on Monday. The kids are in school. You're starting games at 630. People can't get there from Bel Air or Ellicott City at 630. And people don't like coming into the city. That's not me. I, I don't mind. I don't feel like I'm going to get shot or killed or all the crap that Fox 45 is peddling. And now the Baltimore Sun's going to be peddling. Um, and... The future of the franchise and the future of the city are interlocked. They're interwoven because you saw the stadium come online 32 years ago, like I did. And it changed the city. It, it changed the way we felt about the city. And the baseball team could be a real catalyst in that, in a way that John Angelos and the Angelos family had no ability. They had no ability to communicate. They had no ability to be kind. They had no ability to be accountable. They had no integrity. They were liars. All of them. They, they were awful people. And it, it can be called that one way or another. But the remnants of that are he hired Mike Elias. The team's really good. The team's worth going to see. Right. But somehow Westberg does has a walk off on a 55 degree night. And, you know, it looked like there were 7000 people there. And, you know, 10, whatever, whatever there were, there's plenty of room. For Ed Frankovic's family and Nestor Aparicio's family and my neighbors and my friends, but none of us have been invited. As a matter of fact, smart people, educated people, journalists, people connected to journalists understood what was going on there long before Rock Cabaco took a job there and Massim was made and they started – Tom Davis became – sitting in the owners. But like all the people that used to be journalists became employees. Rob right. Long, Jason Lock, and for go down the line, people I gave in careers to, and usurping media and not having any questions. And if Rubenstein wants to go on with that, the road is laid for that. And, but I, I don't know that they can be the franchise that they want to be. And this is where, when I talk grown up ish about this, Ed, and I bring grown ups on like you about it, th the real story here for them is affording the best players and whether they're going to be a Tampa Bay market, be, right. be, be a, be a poverty franchise and say, we don't have a bridge. We don't have fans. You know, 
uh, African Americans don't want to come. Hispanics don't want to come after they've thrown the only Hispanic in the history in the history of Baltimore sports media. I'm the only Hispanic to ever do anything, and I've been thrown out for 18 years. And they're now they're dallying as to whether I should be welcome back in, asking people like T.J. Brightman and Greg Bader whether I'm worthy or not. Like it's insane. But that being said, they need to get everybody back. They need they and in order to sign Adley Rutschman and in order to sign Gunnar Henderson, they need money from me and you and everybody else to buy their app to, w- to whatever the club's going to be. I keep calling it the club because that's really what it's going to be. It's going to be an infinity club. And I said to my wife, even watching the Westberg walk off the other night, because she has Verizon friends that are like they're not watching the games because they're not paying the premium and cable television and they're you know old white folks don't. Like streaming, I'm one of them. I don't have any Netflix. I don't have any Spotify. I don't have any Apple TV. I don't have any of that. I don't pay for any of that. My wife buys cable TV, so I, I the games are on, right? And I don't care what I pay, I guess. But if I knew what I paid, I'd probably care a whole lot more. But the Orioles are going to need to be a different kind of business. And you've been a hockey guy your whole life. Hockey's always been a fight club that only hockey people are in, non-hockey people, and we all have them, don't get it. They love wrestling, they love baseball, they love football, but they don't get hockey. Luke Jones can care less about hockey. He's been my friend 15 years. Doesn't know, doesn't know a puck from a truck. Doesn't care to know and will never know and doesn't get the channel and isn't tuned in and doesn't follow hockey things and hockey people. The baseball team needs to hit the nerve center of our community again. And in order to do that, they need to be so much better than they were. And I hope they are. And I, that's my my wish and my prayer for David Rubenstein, and I'm going to write to him and just say, you have no idea how traumatized and terrorized thinking people have been here in regard to giving the baseball team their money. Right. I mean, when the football team left, and you and I remember that well, I was a freshman at Maryland, and the, and the Mayflower trucks took them to Indianapolis. This beloved- I still have this, football. by the way. I still, yeah. this is my belt buckle. Still have it. Yeah, I love it. The beloved Baltimore Colts, and they made a movie about it, Diner, for those of you who, uh, you know, old movie, great movie. I know you love that one, too. And uh, the the city rallied around the baseball team. The baseball team became the focus. I remember clearly me and my buddies going down to Jamaica in when I was 26 years old, 1991. These guys were from Chicago. Chicago, big baseball town. Cubs, White Sox. These guys said to us, you guys got the baseball, right? Because this whole city rallied around that baseball team when the football team left. And Cal Ripken was, you know, in his prime, 91 was his MVP year. And the team uh, would go, they'd have big years in what, 96, 97 in the playoffs. I mean. But the Renaissance was really around the stadium, not around the team, because the team wasn't very good. 89, they were, they had a punch, but there were no wild cards, any of that stuff. I mean, the, the Orioles were really good in 79, 80, 81, 83, then 89. And then not again till 96. So like in that period of time where we all love the Orioles, they weren't great. I mean, they really no, they, weren't. I mean. No, they weren't. And, and it, you know, the farm team had rotted, right? I mean, that was one of the big problems. When you and I were growing up in the 70s, they always had guys to bring up. They were coming up from Rochester. They invested in the farm team. And it was clear they started rotting that. And I don't know when that happened. I know Hoffberger sold them to what? To Bennett Williams. And then Bennett Williams was a big free agency guy. And then, you know, you had another owner in there. I forget the name. And then it went to Eli Jacobs. Yep. Jacobs. That's right. I write books about this stuff. I tried to tell the Rubenstein guy that. (laughs) (laughs) I know know this stuff. Yeah. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. And um, and then, you know, you're right. It was the stadium, but there was also Cal, right? The streak, the streak. We had the streak to get us through those years, right? 94, 95. um, But the stadium was, was designed for the city. Not to enrich the ownership. I mean, the fact that that the Angelos family, that he's on a beach on Instagram with $1.7 billion after wrecking the franchise. Uh, you know, like literally what I told the Rubens, like, is you wrecked the franchise. What you see here is a shell. It, it was burned to the ground and the team was so bad and and he hired Elias and this thing's been good for 15 minutes this thing's been in the oven for a a, a year and a half Mm -hmm. being decent again after being moribund moribund 
So you literally are starting from scratch again. And how you engage this is, I mean, let me ask you, Ed, how old are your kids now? Because I lose track. You, you and Gary, you have so many of them and they're all on ice skates and you're freezing your ass off in a hockey rink like Tom Cap did with his kid and Jason Deed or everybody else whose kid who loved hockey. But give me a, a recap on your family, because I know your dad had some health issues, but you and your father are corridor buoy people who would have been Washington senators, people you shared capitals, bullets, Georgetown, Maryland, but you love Baltimore. Your father loved the Orioles and the Colts, but you're unique in that way because your family read the Washington post when you were a kid. Yeah, we grew up in Laurel and all my buddies were Redskin fans. Um, we were all Oriole fans because that was the only baseball team. And we would truck up to Memorial stadium, drive up there to 33rd street when we got our licenses. And actually as kids, we would go up, but uh, my dad, my dad's from New York, New Jersey area, right? He grew up a Yankees fan, huge baseball fan. I forgot that. Yeah. And he was a Rangers fan, you know, and that's how he, he was a hot hockey. He was big in New York up there. So he moved down here. The Capitals didn't come to him as nine. When I was growing up, it was the Orioles. Baseball's first love. Obviously, the Orioles were great. I still remember being in kindergarten, five years old, coming home because it was half day kindergarten and watching the Orioles beat the Reds in the World Series when I was five years old. I love See, I don't have those memories. You're a couple years older than me. I was born in 68. So my first memories are 73. My dad took me out to the A's Orioles um, ALCS. I, you know, I was there when Palmer pitched against Vita Blue or Honor, excuse me, Honor. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have still have the scorecard. My dad kept score that day. Um, and so, you know, I, I was at 73, 74, Felix Mion, Rusty Staub, you know, yeah. Pete Rose, oh, yeah. Bud Harrelson, that that those are my first baseball man. And literally the the Rangers being in Texas, but not I never knew the Washington Senators because that I, I, it's 73. It was kind of when I came on board, you know. Yeah, they were gone. They yeah, they moved. I remember they moved seventy. I don't have a Super Bowl five memory, I don't or three memory or any Mets, Reds, Pirates. Clemente had died. One of my first memories was Clemente dying. And and yeah. Hank Aaron hitting the home run in 74. I was watched that live. I mean, I have vivid, vivid memories of those yep. baseball moments in 73, 74, Fisk in 75. But I don't I don't have any I don't have what you have. I don't have the Reds. I have all yeah. of that on Major League Baseball films. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah, it, it was Brooks Robinson was unbelievable. Right. And I was you know, I was young. Right. I, I just remember the games were during the day back then. They didn't do night World Series games. But the Orioles were always – what I remember is the Orioles were always good when I was growing up. Every year they had a chance. And your dad could put you in the family roadster and bring you up to a game too. Yeah, we, we, we went to a lot of games when I was growing up. And the other, the reason we're Colts fans, my dad had season tickets to the Colts. And I was in the stands. Here's another one I'm going to pull out for you. I was at the 44-34 Joe Namath-Johnny Unitas game. It was the first football game I really remember. And it seemed like every time Namath ba dropped back to pass, it was a bomb to Don Maynard for a touchdown. We were sitting in the upper deck – on the third base side of the baseball field. And I still remember that game vividly. It was one of the best football games I've so ever seen. So that was 72. Mm -hmm. and, and right. My first game was when Domris replaced Johnny U. Oh I told Joe Ortiz this as we talked at the Ritz Carlton last week. And by the way, Joe Ortiz is welcoming me, wants me to become a Chargers fan now that the Ravens have thrown me out, me and my family. Uh, he said they have plenty of room in San Diego. And I told him, I said, you know what? My dad took me to my first football game in September 1973. Stan White sacked Joe Namath, separated his shoulder, but the Colts lost 34 to seven or 34 to. It was a, they, they got their ass kicked. And mm -hmm. um, I have the ticket stub. Every time I see Stan White, I, you know, I've told that story. It's going to be in the 40th anniversary um, documentary that Blue Rock Productions and Greg Landry's doing uh, on mm -hmm. my career and what we've done. Um, but it's. It, you never forget. I, I I sat in the end zone in the temporary seats out in center field in yep, the grass where the band was and the and the the, the pep yep. band and all that stuff. I, I, like and I remember the uniforms. I you know I remember Ricky Bell catching a touchdown pass in front of me. You know like I I you just rem John Riggins ran for like 120 yards in that game for the for the Jets. So mm -hmm. um and every time I pointed out, Stan White says. We threw seven interceptions in that game. Wow. And I looked Marty it up Domrez. and I'm like, damn, if you didn't. He said, you never forget when you're playing a football game with your team. It was Marty Domrez and uh, a very young Burt Jones. He had just been dressed. So, like, nonetheless, I I remember my first game was Colts-Jets, too. All, and it was mm -hmm. 50 years ago. It's amazing all these years later how much 
We love sports and we mark our lives by sports. But I ask you about your children because you raised hockey kids, right? Like, I don't know if you've taken your kids to a baseball game or whatever. I know you had season tickets below me. I was in Section 513 for years. I'd see your jersey. It would say Frankovic across mm -hmm. your back above the band. You were like in Section 113, like Correct. below me, right? And I, I – Clearly, Chad Steele, you can go read up on all the awfulness that the, the Ravens have partaken in, in trying to put me out of business. Um, but I, I, I like I don't see you at games anymore. We went to a billion hockey games together. What's your allegiance to the Orioles and your family? Like, are, Will your kids want to go to a game once or twice a year or is that just not what they do for baseball? Yeah, they would. My wife actually worked for one of the Orioles team doctors before, when we first started dating back in the, in the late 90s. But yeah, they... My my wife's grandmother would watch every Orioles game up until she died a few years ago during COVID. And then she didn't die from COVID, but um, she was just old at 93. But um, yeah, we would go. I mean, we my company has done a couple of games. We did Oriole games. They did an Oriole game last September. Unfortunately, I was traveling for hockey. I didn't get to go, but um, we we would go. We would go for several games Uh if we want it, right? See, this would be a fun thing for me to do with you, right? So I keep thinking to myself, now that Angelos doesn't own the team, the reason I'm reaching people like you, like Chris Pika and I left the stadium together on opening day. I rode him home. He had a seat in the upper deck. He offered me a seat. I, I had a club level thing and I like he sold a seat. His wife was sick. So we didn't go to the game, but I went up in the eighth inning and sat with him. We ended the game. We left the stadium together. Like I actually was with friends on opening day and that was, and if you look at any of my pictures, people are like, you're really smiling. I'm like, well, I'm happy. I'm seeing people I love. And one of the things that I told Howard share, and I know, you know, Howard, Howard was my DJ partner 30 years ago. And Howard comes on once or twice a year, comes in as a crab cake. Um, he, he, he's, he's a duck sucker. He's in the duck sucking business, duck doctors. And Howard's been one of my best friends since we were at skipjack games together in the eighties. And he even said to me, I can't believe Barry sat on my lap when he was like this big. And now mm -hmm. he's 39 years old, you know? So my son, so Howard and I were together and we're in a club level and, you know, he had a couple of beers and we're there and we're people watching in the fourth inning and watching the game on TV in the club level. And I said to him, you know, you dirty SOB, if I tried to put a night together with wives to go to dinner, you'd have an excuse. If I had an event and said, come, you'd have an excuse. If I said, hey, you want to go to an Oreo game on a random Tuesday night? The weather's nice. Hey, I got my daughter, did, did, I got did, did, you know, whatever. I can't get people together to do anything. And I said, so on opening day, everybody gathers. It's kind of like being in the beer garden at Heritage right. Fair. They just show up. So all you got to do is walk around and you'll see everybody that you want to see, but you can't make it like you. People like you. Because if I hit you and I'm like, hey, Ed, we want to go to the game on the 19th and see the Tigers, you'd be like, I got things to do. I got hockey that night. So opening days, like this day where Baltimore people come together and I got to see people. But the Orioles have been a thing in my life the last 20 years. And I, I told Rubenstein's guy, nobody's ever been nice to me there, ever, ever. It's never been a place I felt welcome. It's never been a place I wanted to leave my money. Um, and really, from the time Angelo's bought it, I saw the deterioration from Johnny Oates forward because I was a media member and I was there every night. And I took the phone calls every day and people would call me to complain. I was their complaint department. and But I want to go back. And I want to be right. a part of it. And part of going back isn't me and my wife getting the family roadster and going down there and sitting in the cold and doing the seventh inning dance and doing the shell game. Part of it's like going with people we care about and love and want to spend time with, right? Like that's the baseball thing is going – you said me and my friends, we would get together, and right? I mean that's what baseball was. Me and my friends would right. get on the bus and we'd go to the games, right? Yep. And, I, you know, I distinctly remember you and I, we were doing a TV show down in PG County with our – our uh, buddy Bill McCaffrey, God rest his soul. And you had just gotten that day. I remember it. You had gotten a call from the Orioles. They were going to give you money to do some stuff. Do you remember this? And it was Christmas they... time. It was Matt Dreyer. Yes, I remember it well. They actually paid that bill. The next bill they didn't pay. Right. I remember then they pulled the rug out from under you. And I do remember you did a WNST night against the Phillies. My wife and I came. We all sat up in the left field. And that's when the bird sprayed you with water that night. I was there that night. Um, actually that but, wasn't the night, uh, the oh, Phillies the night? night was conflating. We had a lot of successful events for them right. and that shows up in the documentary as well, because there's a lot of evidence of wild bill in the upper deck in 2000, 
WNST fans. The, the the incident happened the night before the Preakness. It happened against the Angels. It was about Vladimir Guerrero. We had sold about 1,400 tickets out in, in the bleacher seats on mm-hmm. that night because Guerrero didn't sign with the Orioles. So this was a giving him a hard time for not coming to Baltimore. That's how provincial we were at this that point. That's how pro-Orioles, pro-Baltimore, my company always was on behalf of the Orioles and behalf of the town in, in regard to you know people like Chad Steele who didn't even grow up around around here or come in here and usurp brands and start telling me what's good for Baltimore. It's hilarious. Uh, while they take $600 million of our money and their billionaire guy who pretends to be a nice guy goes running off. I mean, it it's really, it's incredible. It's incredible how much money and how much history and all, and how much love we all have for these brands. And this new owner needs to feel that, and know that and know how many people like you and me are out there that have been dusted by the brand in one way or another. Not everybody was assaulted by the team mascot on a night when a $30,000 bill wasn't paid and then lied to. And I mean, Flanagan, Flanagan died almost sideways with me right. because of what happened that night. And mm-hmm. he was appalled. And he was the one who promised me Quite frankly, shit like that wasn't going to happen anymore, but he wasn't in control of it. He was embarrassed by it. He was mortified. He called me mortified about what happened in 2004 and 2005. Um, And the whole thing came unraveled because they couldn't communicate because they have communicate. I told their communications guy, Mr. Rubenstein's communications uh, person, I told him, you have an organization here that is just horrific at communicating. Like they, they, with everyone, with everyone, with sponsors, with friends, with media, with, they had no communication skills. John Angelos's communication skills were on display last Martin Luther King day. They were on display when he banned Kevin Brown and thought, and, and in the end, no one talked about it. You know, no one had Kevin Brown's back inside the organization. Not, none of them, none of them came out loud. I mean, Palmer, McDonald, all those guys could have said, this is bullshit. You know, right. any of them could have said that they didn't. Yeah, Nobody, no, the only one that ever said it was bullshit was me. Yeah, and it was bad. And, and it's just, they're all, it's hush money, right? They're all paid. They're afraid of losing their jobs. Again, it goes back to journalism is not tyranny, ter- terrorization, and trauma. That's what mm-hmm. I said. It, that, that was, that defines 30 years. That's the way I'll always remember it. Um, and that's not to, you know, God rest Mr. Angelos' soul. He, he hung on. His kids got wealthy. I mean, at the end of this story, there needs to be something good for my town. Beyond so the next billionaire coming in and spending billionaire money and coming in. At the end of this, there needs to be – it needs to be more than a casino. It needs to be more than an empty stadium. It needs to be more than an empty parking lot that people may or may not want to come to, right? Like all of the things that Peter screwed up, Sports Legends Museum, he destroyed it. Right. Yeah, Literally, Peter destroyed it. So, I, I mean, Peter destroyed the night we were supposed to celebrate the Super Bowl victory. Like, so, like, Peter was destructive. And I don't mind portraying it in that way because that's the fact. It's a fact. And and these are the things that Rubenstein needs to clean up. So how involved is Ripken going to be? Here's a guy who grew up in this area, right? A local guy. How much say does he have? How much does Cal want this to get back to where it was i i i don't know i haven't talked to cal in a long time uh, you, you know i was not at the press conference last week where he and rubenstein and westmore um i i was not allowed uh to ask questions and apparently it was because of the key bridge and and the governor being there it was a different kind of press conference than that listen if david rubenstein's gonna be, i know one thing i'm not going anywhere i'm gonna be here right and mm-hmm. if if Anybody wants to sit. I'm, I'm like Mr. Andrew. Anybody wants to sit and talk to me? I'm a very available individual. I'll, I get crab cake tours. I'm here. I want to educate the public. I want to be educated. I want to I want to feel the integrity. I want to feel the reach. I want to feel the sincerity. I want to feel the community. Um, I feel the business and the, the need. I respect that. 
They need to fill the place up to afford Adley Rutschman and Gunnar Anderson. If you want those kinds of players, if you want Corbin Burns here the next five years at $160 million, if you if you want that kind of baseball, we have to do better than 12000 down there on a 50-degree night at $9 tickets. And... I'm afraid of the city. It costs too much money. Like all of that. There needs to be a real level of investment from our community. Otherwise, they're Tampa. And I mean that sincerely. Right. I mean, like. Absolutely. Because the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Red Sox, they print money. They're always going to sell out. They've got their big cable deals. um, And they always sell at their stadiums, right? Because they want to win. The Orioles model has not been they want to win. It's the Angelus model was we're going to make money at the expense of the city. And they, that's so. all they did. I mean, they made money and made money and stashed mass and money and hid mass and money from the, from the learners and from major league baseball, like all along. That's what they did. You can do the math on all of it for what they invested. Now I will say this and all respect to Mr. Angelos. And I wrote this in the Peter principles. He was really upside down. When he was signing Jeff Conine and David Segui and Sidney Ponson, he was 20, 30 million out of his own pockets into the franchise. In the same way that Rubenstein and these guys come in a billion, a billion seven, if they go giving Gunnar Henderson and these people money and they roll this payroll out to 140 million or 150 million, I don't know that the revenue supports that right now. Right. They have to. I, I, this doesn't like, I mean, I look at the stadium, I look at their, like Masson printed a lot of money that they hid from themselves. And they had a contract that was just unbelievable that the, the more they kept away from the nationals, the more they had to keep away from the Orioles. It was, it was a poison pill that was destructive. And I think at the heart of it, that's the dirtiest thing they did. And that's the thing I would bring up to Rubenstein if I had an ear to him and say, you know, for 20 years, since this network started every year, they tourniqueted how much money, TV money they would take for themselves. They always took as little as possible because they had to pay the nationals as little as possible. And that kept more for the Angelos family to just mm-hmm. take that money, just take that cable television money and never have any, it never had anything to do with baseball. Uh, so they, they, I don't know what happened to all the money. You have to ask John, but there's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that were usurped in a profit side of this over the course of the last 20 years, in addition to the billion seven, in addition to that. So did the Rubenstein, this group get the uh, mass and two in the deal? Oh yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, they have yeah. it all now. John Angelos yeah. is out of, is out of the deal. Right. So yeah. Cause I, like you, I don't have streaming. I do have, I do get Comcast Xfinity and I watch the Oriole games there. Now I can stream Netflix and stuff like that, but I don't watch hockey games streaming. I watch them, whatever they put on TV, I'll watch them. I'll watch baseball. If it's I, I'm watching the Orioles again just because the the ownership changed, right? I didn't watch many games last year. They were good last year. I didn't watch a lot because I just I was so ruined on baseball by the ownership. But now that there's a new ownership, there's new hope, if you will. I'm going to watch. I Guys know like you it. and me want to come back. We never wanted to leave. We never wanted right. to be lied to. We never wanted to be subjected to 115 losses a year. Right. Uh, like, And especially guys like you and me who were 15, 16, 18 years old as journalists covering professional hockey, interviewing Dr. J after games. Right. And like – like 40 years later, I, I cannot be lobotomized into being an idiot to – to pedal, sit there in an Oriole bird outfit and tell lies to my community. I'm not doing that. Right. I'm not. I, mean, I never was going to do that. You have, I mean, you, you look, you're the most pro Oriole, pro Raven guy there is, but you weren't going to sit there and just tell them everything was great all the time. Right. I mean, that's what, that's what we do. You and I have followed sports for forever. We would point out the good and we wanted them to win, but we would have to point out the bad. That's your job as a journalist and to ask the questions, to find out what their strategies are, what they're trying to do, where the organization is headed. That's what you do as a journalist, right? But journalism is is not what it was when you and I were growing up in the 80s and doing it. And, you know, I left journalism to go work for the team and you brought me back in with your, your website in 2007. But I worked for the Capitals and we saw the Capitals disintegrate. Uh, they moved downtown. I mean, same type of thing. They were begging people to go to games. It wasn't until, you know, Leonsis came in and he tried to do it with Yager and that failed. But that ultimately led to Alex Ovechkin. And ultimately, 
our good buddy Barry Trotz came in in 2014 and was he's a GM now. He was part GM when he came in there with Brian McClellan. And they built a team and they won playoff series after playoff series for four years. And they won a Stanley cup and he filled his building with Alex Ovechkin and that winning culture. And they haven't won a playoff series since Barry Trotz left. And I know, you know that, and I know that, and they're going to be in trouble when Alex Ovechkin uh, wins when he breaks Gretzky's record, it didn't look like he was going to do it, but he's hot now. And he's probably going to do it if he can keep himself in shape. And what's going to happen after Ovechkin? The Orioles lived off Ripken for years in the street, right? What's going to happen afterwards? That's where you have to have an organization in place. And, you know, that's what the Orioles didn't have. And we all knew it was Angelos just making money for years. So we tuned it out. I didn't follow it. I mean, I did not follow the Orioles for years. And now I want to come back, right? Now that they have new ownership. You got your and, orange shirt on. Look at you, Eddie. Yeah. I got my WNST golf shirt from circa <laughs> 2010 here. And look at that. Um, I don't even own one of those. <laughs> I don't. Ed Frankovic yeah. is here. He was our longtime hockey insider. He has been my media friend for 40 years. Uh, he does really important jobs in keeping uh, Americans safe uh, and uh, also is, is always at a hockey rink. Uh, and after all the years of hockey and sort of cold turkey and I reached the trots, I almost went to Nashville today. The Black Crows are opening their tour tonight at the Grand Old Opry. So I actually literally had a flight today Ooh. to Nashville. Didn't go. I still never been to the Grand Old Opry. Oh, um, it's gorgeous. Just, you got to go. You got to yeah, go. Yeah, don't tell me that today i you know i just i'm not feeling it because of where i am workflow and where my mojo is and i just got back from florida last week and the orioles just got sold um but there's quite a story to tell about this community and our love of sports and now we've had the bridge disaster and the port all of these things that are concocting and maneuvering we have the best football team in a sport last year and lost championship game, best baseball team, 101 wins. You know, now there's been an ownership change. There's just a lot for me to process at this point in my career, right? Like, and taking it all in and seeing real change and knowing how long I've waited for this change. And I told Rubenstein's guy, I'm like, you know how long I've waited for you people to come in here and make this thing better? <laughs> you think You think I want to be a part of effing it up? You think I want to be anti you after what I've dealt with here? I'm 55 years old. It's Baltimore positive, bro. We're all trying to do the same thing here. Yeah. That guy was a creep, and I always call him a creep. And I don't – alive, dead, whatever. He It, it was awful. It, it was awful, and I'll never portray it as anything other than what it was. It was awful. Yeah, I mean, this guy has a great chance. And let's be honest. I mean, there are so many more people in this area, Nestor. I mean, the population has grown a ton it would be very easy for them to do this right and fill that stadium again. They could do it. They just have to put the effort in. They have to make the connections. Communication. It comes back to what you were saying earlier in our talk. You have to communicate. You have to be out there. You have to reach to people. And you can bring it back. If, if it's done right, they could do it. Well, I hope they find some way to do it with some authenticity, and um, which is what I feel like I would bring to the table if they let me back in. <laughs> Listen, I ain't begging for a press pass. And Luke has even said, if they let you in, how often will you go? And I, you know what I said? I'm 55 years old, Ed. It depends on how I'm treated. Right. Like, literally. You know, like, literally. If I'm going to go down there and have TJ Brightman and Greg Bader restrict my access, I'm drinking out of a different water cooler, I am treated like, the, you know – the, the, the guy whose skin's a different color who they brought in and I glow green in the corner like a Martian. And it, it, I, I, I deserve better than that. I've always deserved better than that. Uh, I've demanded yeah. better than that. And therefore I haven't subjected myself to that. Um, and I, and I, I won't, I won't. Yeah. You, you, a lot of these media outlets like the capitals, they, they invest in the post and they invest in these places and, and and the the coverage of it for the Capitals, for example, where the Washington Post is compared to back in the day, you and I knew the Bob Fache, right? And they haven't had a really good uh, reporter covering the Capitals since Tariq El Bashir left. And his kid plays hockey, right? His kid's playing for the Maryland Black Bears down there in Piney Orchard, and he's going to play for Alaska next year. His kid grew up playing hockey, right? Like my kids, and it. it it's just not the same the way it was. They do give preference. These sports franchises give preferential treatment to the, the companies that they're paying to, to publicize for them. And it's just, it's not like it was back when you and I started out in the eighties 
and going to Capitals games, going to Bullet games, uh, Oriole games. It's totally different than it was. It's 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 big money. It's a big business right now. But the Orioles have a chance to expand their business if they do this right. I mean, it's easier for the Ravens because there are eight games a year, right? At home, you can fill the stadium, and and they have a good team. Like you said, they had the best. You gave your year. tickets up for the Ravens. You don't go to the Ravens yeah, games anymore. I don't go anymore. My kid, I'm too busy with my kid, my three kids. And it was just too much to spend a whole Sunday down there. Um, and it, it's now I don't see many games because I'm usually in a hockey rink on Sundays in the fall. But uh, I did go to the Bengals game, the Thursday night game. Um, I did have tickets. So you still you remain a, a, a avid Raven supporter. Yeah. And okay. and it was uh, yeah, they did have the best team. They just choked in the championship. I mean, they, they picked their bad game. Um, and that's the way it is. Um, we both remember. 2012, the, the game in New England where Lee Evans didn't hold on to the ball and then kind of hit the upright. And we went out, we got Justin Tucker, and the next year we win the Super Bowl. So maybe this loss in the championship this year spurs them to next year, right? But they have to figure out a way like they did to beat Tom Brady back then. And they did have Brady's number pretty good for, for our franchise. They have to figure out a way to beat Patrick Mahomes next year as well as Joe Burrow and some other teams that are going yes. to be coming on as well. So, Ed, I love you, man. I miss you. A, a ball game. Uh, I mean, we watched a million hockey games. Let's let's go to a Hershey Bears game or so. I don't know. we got to figure something out, right? They won the cup last year. Yeah, they're going to be in the playoffs. They have a great team down there. Yeah, Hershey Bears, All my kids are all about going to Hershey, uh, especially my youngest loves roller coasters. So Hershey is one of his favorite spots. All right. Well, we're going to have to work something out for something up there other than Hootie and the Blowfish uh, before the summer is over. Ed Frankovic uh, has been my friend for 40 years. Um, he will be featured in the uh, documentary that's uh, coming out. Um, I, I'm releasing the name of the documentary right now. Ed, you, do you want to know the name of the documentary? Absolutely. No one listens. Everyone hears. It's a story of my life, right? Really is, oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, we have one listener, right? For how many no years? One no listens. one listens. Yeah, no one listens. Uh, so that's coming out. And um, Ed and I met at the Capitol Center in uh, 1984. I was uh, 15 years old, 16 years old, 16. I just turned 16. Um, it was actually my birthday. And the, you can see the byline and the birthday and see it was on my, my 17th birthday mm -hmm. that Pelly Lindbergh died. Uh, but I had been covering the Skip Jackson. So all that stuff's going to be in the movie, all the stuff that you remember over 40 years. But Ed covered the Capitals here for the better part of a decade and a half and uh, winning uh, a Stanley Cup. He and I were together in Las Vegas. We were together in uh, all sorts of hockey rinks for years and years and years with Barry Trotz, who's now down in Nashville trying to win uh, a, a their first Stanley Cup. That, that would be apropos. I do remember, you know, Trotz left, came to Washington. Jen beat right. cancer in 15. And then the Predators were in the finals. And all I could before. think about was poor Trotz had to watch the franchise that he was at for 20 years. Like, kind of like Earl Weaver having to broadcast the 83 World Series after he right. wasn't in it. It was a little weird. So I hope Trotz gets his cup down in Nashville. They have a chance, right? Oh, yeah. They absolutely. They, they, they had a streak recently. They went 16 wins and two losses in overtime. They're in a nice spot. I think they're going to play Vancouver in the first round. I think they can definitely beat them. That what someone whoever wins the cup this year is going to come out of the Western Conference, Nestor. And there are six or seven teams that can win it. All right. Well, I'll talk hockey with you next time. I haven't been to a hockey game since the last time I went to a hockey game with you. So that's how long it's been. It's been yeah, it's been a long time. And like like I told you, I don't go down to DC anymore. I watch them on TV. The good old hockey game. It's the best game you can name. Uh, Ed Frankovic is. Uh, Still my friend, even after I sing to him. Uh, we're going to be out on the road doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. On the 9th, we're going to be at Costas all morning, right up until 2 o'clock. We're going to be talking about the Key Bridge and the Peninsula. Um, I don't want to say I'm an expert on all things east side. I'm certainly not an expert on bridges, um, but I am an expert on the history of things on the east side. And I do remember life before the bridge, and now we have life after the bridge um, and the dredging and all that stuff. We'll be talking about that at Costas on the 9th. On the 12th, we'll be at Fadley's. I'm wearing my Fadley shirt. Established in 1887, but moved into the new Lexington Market as of opening day last week. I had my first Fadley's Crab Cake in the new location, and I'm telling you, it's all new equipment, all new fryers. They're telling me about this drainage system they have. And I will say this. It was the best Fadley's Crab Cake I've ever had. I told Damie after my second bite, I'm like, oh, my God, your food tastes better here. She's like, it's all new equipment, and it's all timed, and it's all perfect. And I'm like, Let's get down to Fadley. So Luke and I will be there from 2 until 3 live. I'll be there 2 to 5 live on the 12th. And then every Friday. And Ed Frankovic, you're invited. 
every Friday from 2 until 5, we'll be there giving away Maryland lottery tickets and having some fun. I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking Baltimore positive.